um, and, and, and welcome uh, to the ninth meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee 2019. Uh, can I remind everybody to switch their mobile phones off? And can I give apologies for the convener, James Doran, who is uh, trapped on a train outside Haymarket, I'm told. So there you go. That's probably not a surprise to most train users. <laughs> um, the first item is the, the consideration of whether to take agenda item six in private. Can we agree to take it in private? Agreed. Thank you, agreed. Agenda item two is subordinate legislation um, is the consideration of a statutory instrument which would give the public the right to request information from registered social landlords and their subsidiaries about public functions they perform. The committee will take evidence from Graham Day, Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans, Jerry Hendricks, Head of Freedom of Information Unit, Graham Crombie, Head of Policy, Freedom of Information Unit, and Christine Rie, Solicitor, Scottish Government. Welcome. Um, this instrument is laid under affirmative procedures, which means that the Parliament must approve it before the provisions can come into force. Following the evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda item to consider the motion to approve the instrument. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a, a short presentation statement? Uh, thank you, Deputy Convener. Um, I'm pleased to speak in favour of this motion. Uh, today's order is the third such order to be laid by this government in the past six years. Uh, it will increase further the reach of Scotland's freedom of information legislation, which aims to promote openness, transparency and accountability. The order proposes to extend freedom of information to around 160 registered social landlords and their subsidiaries. Uh, these bodies undertake key public functions by providing housing accommodation where an RSL is granted a Scottish secured uh, tenancy or a short Scottish secured tenancy. Uh, bringing these bodies within the scope of freedom of information will increase the public's information rights. Once the order comes into effect, the public will have the right to ask these bodies for information under both Freedom of Information Scotland Act and the Environmental Information Scotland regulations. Scotland's first order under Section 5 brought within scope of FOI a wide range of arm's length organisations established by local authorities to provide leisure, sporting and cultural services. Evidence from the previous Scottish Information Commissioner presented in her special report to Parliament in 2015 found that for most arm's length bodies Quest level stayed the same. The report also found that becoming subject to FOI had not made responding to information requests more or less difficult for the affected bodies. However, the report noted the importance of allowing adequate time for preparation of designation, so it's clearly important, as with any new regulation, to be prepared for its impact from day one. Um, I'd, li I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Scottish Information Commissioner for his commitment in offering to support, over the coming months, those organisations now proposed for inclusion. Uh, once the order is in force, uh, we and the Commissioner will be closely monitoring its impact to inform proposals in preparation for future orders. Um, can, you know, I, I know that not all including some who responded to the most recent consultation, are satisfied with the rate of progress in terms of extending uh, coverage. However, I want to take the opportunity to restate that we, the Scottish Government, are committed to extending coverage. We said that we will consider whether bodies that provide health and social care functions should be included, and work is underway in that area. The Parliament also agreed last year that the Scottish Government should consult on proposals to further extend coverage of freedom of information, for example, to companies providing services on behalf of the public sector. Uh, consulting on proposals for further extension is crucial to the success of further Section 5 orders and my officials are considering options for designating more bodies um, and I would look forward to updating the Parliament when we weigh a further report on the use of Section 5 powers later this year and I would uh, ask that today the committee would support this motion. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, Andy. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Thanks, uh, Minister. In your, in your policy note, um, you say that in the interest of transparency and accountability, Scottish ministers consider appropriate that RSLs and their subsidiaries should be subject to the provisions of the Act. Um, you say that designating such bodies as Scottish public authorities would remove the an anomalous situation where identical services, such as the provision of housing accommodation by local authority, are already subject to FOI. Um, given that, for example, 
private schools already provide statutory education services. Is that an anomalous situation where public schools um, are already subject to FOI? How far one would one take this alleged anomalous situation? I'm going to bring my officials in to deal with the specific details of that. Uh, Graham, do you want to come in on that? Uh, thank you. Um, In, in, in relation to this, the, the approach that ministers take is an incremental one overall. I would say that in the second designation order, which was made in 2016, that um, certain independent schools, independent special schools, were brought within the ambit of FOISA. And that was done at the same time as other... Um, <clears throat> and, that, and that was done, I beg your pardon, in order to resolve the perceived anomaly that other special schools were subject to the legislation, but those independent ones were not. So the ministers do look at these matters um, on, I say, on an incremental basis and when they're brought um, to their attention and they consider carefully for designation bodies in accordance with the principles that they have already set out. But can we take it that as a matter of policy, the Scottish Government <coughs> has, as a matter of policy, uh, takes the view that such anomalous situations are candidates for FOI extension? We have a programme um, lying ahead of us of, of um, further work that we are going to undertake to look at designating other bodies. Um, if, Mr Whiteman, you have um, specific concerns that might um, influence our thinking, I'm happy to hear from you. If you want to write to me on that, um, subject, and we can certainly take a look at that in the context of the upcoming work we're going to be doing. Okay, thanks. Moving on to um, evidence from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. Um, they note that um, other legislation that RSLs will also come under um, as an unintended consequence of extension, they talk about the gen general data protection regulations um, and the definition of public bodies given within those regulations, is those bodies classed as public <laughs> authorities under FOISA? Uh, they talk about payroll legislation, again, a public authority is defined as those covered by FOI. And conversely, they draw attention to the Lobbying Scotland Act, which will no longer apply to RSLs because the Act specifically exempts bodies that are subject to FOI. Now, there may be other legislative provisions whereby public authorities are defined in reference to whether they're covered by FOI or not. Have you considered the... Um, impact? Have you analysed the impact of these consequences? Have you taken any view on whether it's desirable, for example, that RSL should no longer be covered by the Lobbying Act? There's been quite an extensive uh, exercise undertaken to look at how we get to the, the best possible position <coughs> around capturing RSLs. Um, all aspects of that have been considered. Um, we think where we've ended up is the appropriate place. Can I again bring an official in to respond to this? Because this is obviously a situation I inherited when I became a minister. I, Graham would have more detailed understanding of the process that was going through earlier on. Uh, thank you. Um, in relation to the, the pieces of legislation that have been mentioned by the Federation, I'd make two points. The first, I think, is that uh, we have um, both considered and engaged with the Federation in relation to those matters. They were raised with us. I think it would be fair to say that we do not necessarily share the analysis that the Federation has arrived at um, as set out there. The second point, I think, to make is that, um, as, as suggested, these, these are not unintended consequences of designation. What, what has happened in each of these cases is that um, Parliament has decided when passing the, the other pieces of legislation, for example, the Lobbying Act, that it will take a particular position in relation to bodies that are or are not designated for FOISA purposes. Um, and that's, that's a policy decision that was taken at that time. So if Parliament decided that um, bodies which were subject to FOISA should not be subject to the lobbying legislation, that's a consequence of the decisions round about lobbying, not a consequence of the decisions round about FOISA. Um, Okay. Uh, there, there is, of course, also I think the um, Public Audit Committee are doing a bit of post-legislative scrutiny around this legislation. Um, and clearly, if, if you have concerns in that area, you may want to feed in your thoughts uh, to that uh, committee when it's carrying out that piece of work. 
Sounds like I've got some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, Campaign for Freedom of Information also draw attention to the fact that this is, um, I think, the first time that we have designated public authorities for the purposes of FOI, uh, but have further restricted the definition by only making reference to particular functions that those bodies carry out. Is that correct, that this is the first time that's happened, as opposed to just designating the bodies as public authorities and making them subject to FOI? The answer, the answer is we don't have an answer specific to that, um, and I'm afraid. Um, I think what you're getting at is that we have looked at specific uh, elements of the activities of RSLs and not just captured them in general. So there was a, a, a concern that we ought to uh, take into account factoring, for example, um, and that's not been um, included in that. The reason that factoring hasn't been covered is that ministers can only extend coverage to bodies which appear to exercise functions of a public nature. The order has to say that those, what those functions are. We consulted on whether or not the provision of factoring services should be one of those functions, and there were a number of competing arguments made about whether it is or isn't a function of a public nature. We had to consider that very carefully. Um, and after that detailed consideration, we've arrived at the position we have, uh, which is a conclusion that it's essentially a private arrangement between the RSL as factor and the owner. But that's not necessarily the end of the story, because where, where factoring is concerned, because we've noted that certain aspects of factoring, which apply to all factors, not just RSLs, might be considered to be functions of a public nature. So we could therefore uh, consider consulting on factoring services more broadly in future. That's an option that's open to us. So we could potentially eventually capture that too. So would one example of that be uh, what's been drawn to our attention by Anne Booth, who um, introduced petition 01539 uh, on this question where she talks about the fact that she is factored by uh, housing associations, subsidiary, and she lives side by side with tenants um, who are factored um, uh, by the local authority, I think she's suggesting, and therefore those are very similar functions, and therefore she feels that... Uh, um, is that not a private house, though, that's factored? Yeah, and I think I think that's where there will be competing views on whether that should be captured or not. Yeah, um, and I would leave it at that. I mean, I, I can't give you a definitive answer. But the, the substance of the c c campaign for freedom of information, as I understand it, um, concerns is that because we're defining it and um, it, the, the functions are limited to those for which the RSL has under the Housing Scotland Act 2001 granted a Scottish secure tenancy as defined in Section 11 or a short secure tenancy is defined in Section 34 of the Act. <coughs> it's, it's going to be difficult for users of FOI legislation, who at the moment can request information from Scottish ministers or the local council or mm -hmm. the Forestry Commission, um, and any information they hold uh, has to be released unless it's subject to an existing statutory exemption, which are now fairly broadly understood. People who are looking for information from... Um, housing associations are now going to have to ha face the additional threshold of interpreting whether the information they're seeking relates to these specific functions under the Housing Act. Um, is that not going to cause some confusion and difficulty? I don't, I, I, I don't see that at all. I mean, th this, uh, to me, to my reading, um, is quite simple and straightforward. It's obvious what uh, should and will be available to people to request, and, and what isn't. Um, uh, we're doing this uh, to further extend the scope of the FOI and to assist tenants uh, to be able to access information. Uh, now, clearly, with any um, such measure, we would monitor it going forward, and if it emerged there was any difficulty, we would take that on board, but I really can't see that in this instance. And finally, um, are you um, wedded to the notion that this will come into force on the 11th of November 
2019. Again, uh, SFHA make reference to the fact that there are the staffing considerations, um, training, systems, procurement, legal advice. There's a lot of work to be done by often some very small bodies um, in order to be set up to be compliant with FOI legislation. Um, yes, is the answer. Um, this has not come as a surprise to RSLs. Everyone has known about for a considerable time that, this, that these measures were coming in. We have engaged um, over an extended period with RSLs. Yes, some have, have expressed concerns in that regard. But we've also engaged with the Commissioner. And the Commissioner is of the view that that nine-month period is perfectly workable. The Commissioner, and I'm grateful to him uh, for his work in this regard, is going to engage with the RSLs to uh, assist them. So I, I think that nine months is an appropriate period um, in which to get prepared for this and to hit the ground running. Okay, thanks, Governor. Okay, Graham. Thanks, uh, thanks Governor. You're absolutely right, Minister. They, they will have seen this coming uh, because according to the campaign for freedom of information, it's taken 17 years to get to the point where we're at. Um, so uh, if I can go back to the, 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 the factoring argument, which is about subsidiaries of um, housing associations. If I'm a tenant of a housing association, um, sorry, Mr. Whiteman's waving, I'm not sure why. Um, so if I'm, if I'm a tenant of a housing association uh, and I'm also factored by, by that housing association, why would I not be able to make a freedom of information about the factoring services uh, effectively offered by my landlord? Well, but the, the simple answer is that factoring is not covered by this. But if, oh, let me get so why, why, why shouldn't it be? I'm going to ask Graeme to come in on that. Um, I think it, it may help if we can clarify slightly by saying that factoring services are provided to homeowners. Um, they're not provided to tenants. So the registered social landlord will manage the housing accommodation for its tenants in the same way that any other landlord would manage that. But um, in some cases, um, housing asso registered social landlords, housing associations, for historic reasons, also provide factoring services um, to private homeowners. And these typically are people who have exercised the right to buy. Um, so these are properties which were once upon a time um, tenanted properties, but they are no longer tenanted properties. And that's why there's a factoring relationship rather than a relationship with landlord and tenant. So they are two, there, are, there are two separate relationships, one between RSL and its tenants, one between RSL and the people who have um, purchased those properties and are now homeowners. Right. I mean, you say you're, you're minded to <coughs> extend FOI legislation to factors. Couldn't wouldn't this be a start? Well, I think, I think what I, I was saying was that there is an option there uh, further down the line uh, that we could do that in future, but that would have to be applied on a consistent basis and not simply be targeted at RSLs. So I think, I think it's a case of well, you would look at factoring as factoring across the board. Right. Okay. Thank you. Annabelle? Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, I think this has been very useful because it has clarified a number of, of uh, important issues. I think it has also flagged up that this actually has been under discussion one way or another for quite considerable time. Uh, and uh, I guess if the mood is to do it, then perhaps just to get on with it might be the, the recommendation. Um, in that regard, I understand from my committee papers that the Scottish Information Commissioner is supportive of this order, but perhaps for the record that could just be clarified yes the information commissioner is supportive of the order and of the nine month period and as i said earlier is um committed to working with the rsls to get them best prepared for the commencement date okay thank you because it seems to me that um uh, if that is the case and also i understand that the sfha is also supportive of the order that uh, it would be my inclination given the time lag just to get on with this i would imagine that any changes to the FOI legislation do involve uh, reflection, consideration, consultation, and they are incremental. And I think that is, it seems, the nature of the beast. So I think this falls very squarely within that process 
and I, for one, would be supportive of just getting on with this and extending the legislation. And clearly, I'm, I'm grateful for that view. I mean, just, just to illustrate, perhaps, um, in support of, of your, your interpretation of the situation, we do go through a very extensive process before we arrive at this point. I mean, if you take this particular order, there were two consultation exercises carried out, not only with the stakeholders, but with other individuals who had an interest in this. And there was further extensive engagement with stakeholders beyond that, in order that we got to a point where we have an, a, an order that, that it's right, it's appropriate, it's proportionate, and that we are good to go with this, subject to the committee's approval. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kavira. Okay, thank you very much, Annabelle. <coughs> Any other questions from members? Alexander. Thank you, Kavira. There's no doubt that the Freedom of Information, it's now moved into becoming an industry over the, the timescale uh, from where it started. Uh, and that, in many respects, is a good thing because individuals and organisations get the chance to have that uh, uh, engagement and get the information that they require and request. But there will obviously be some implications uh, from this and resources uh, and costs. Uh, do we have any idea as to what, are there any estimates that have been done to think of what the added on to this may well be uh, and any of the potentials that may happen from that? Okay, um, I can move on to the point about cost, but just to pick up on your point about the development of FOI, um, there are some people who are frustrated about the pace in Scotland. Um, as I said earlier, this will be the third order in six years. And I understand that frustration from a, a layman's perspective, but I've come to learn over the last few months how this legislation really works and the requirements of it. And if I could offer just a little bit of perspective, the UK legislation came in two years before Scotland's did, and in that entire period, the UK has designated just six bodies, and their information commissioner, uh, sorry, their uh, commissioner, has been very critical of the lack of pace and contrasted that unfavourably with what's happened in Scotland. So. The, the way this works, and obviously the, the Public Audit Committee may take a view on, on Section 5, um, how it works can appear to be time-consuming, a little bit cumbersome, um, but we are in Scotland um, going at a faster pace and have the ambition to build upon that than perhaps uh, colleagues elsewhere. And in terms of costs, um, do you have something on that? Well, I'll, I'll uh, say you. something that, you know, we, <coughs> when, we put, when we carry out our uh, reviews of the orders, uh, we haven't seen significant increases in the number of requests that other organisations have had. Uh, request levels have tended to stay the same, so there hasn't been a huge, as big an impact as, as we may have expected. The other thing that I would say is that the Commissioner is looking to support these organisations through training and, and general support as they go forward, and we are... Uh, providing funding to the Commissioner to support that element of this work as well. I think that that's very vitally important, that there is that continuity, uh, that, that organisations get the, the training and the support and the mechanisms to ensure that they can impart that information, because individuals and organisations that want that information uh, want it to be as transparent and as quick back to them as humanly possible. Uh, and that has sometimes been a logjam in the past, uh, because they haven't had uh, the the personnel or the individuals that are there to, to manage that situation, uh, so that has, that has caused them some difficulties. So I, I look forward, Minister, to seeing what progress will be achieved uh, in this whole sector, because I think that there is, there is scope for development, as you've rightly identified, uh, and I think that, that gives us a, an opportunity to see uh, where we are, and in the next year, two years timescale, we'll, we'll be able to then get some clarity as to what the knock-on effect will have been. Uh, and and you, you're, you're, you plan to come back and give us information on how things have progressed or how things are progressing on, on various timescales? So, um, <coughs> the point that Jerry makes about experience, other organisations who have been captured by FOI have not reported a massive upsurge. Perhaps the organisation that has seen the largest upsurge in is, is the Scottish Government. Mm. Um, now, we uh, cover a far wider range of activities than some of the other bodies that have been captured. We also attract requests from journalists, uh, political researchers, as well as the public. And I suspect RSLs and others will not necessarily be in that category. It will largely be their tenants who are um, interested 
in securing information. In terms of going forward, let me maybe just provide a bit of detail uh, of what it is that we are looking to do uh, with a view to the, the future. Um, we are engaging with a number of organisations. This was already flagged up in 2017, uh, including uh, Audit Scotland. We are um, looking at organisations that deliver health and social care functions. Um, we are looking at charities where they provide uh, services which um, are of a public nature. Um, that process is ongoing. Um, it will follow the normal procedures, so I'm not going to say to you this is all going to be done very, very quickly. Um, getting into some of these landscapes will be far um, more challenging than thus far because of the sheer volume of bodies that would be covered, but also the varying functions that they have. And that's not to, to, to get the excuses in early, it's just to recognise that that will be challenging. But we are committed to... Um, progressing in these areas in an appropriate and, as I said before, proportionate way that follows the proper processes. So rest assured that the government's direction of travel on this is to expand FOIS, uh, the, the reach of FOISA and to give the public greater access to information. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Any other questions from members? In that case, before I move on to agenda item three, can I just give my apologies for being late and thank Alec for uh, standing in for me. Uh, agenda item three is a formal consideration of motion S5M15924 calling for local government and communities committee to recommend approval of the Draft Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002 designation of persons in Scottish public authorities, Order 2019. I invite the Minister to speak to and move this motion. Um, nothing I'll say other than thank the committee for its consideration and to move the motion, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Andy? Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I'll be voting for um, this today. However, it does raise some, uh, I think, distinctive challenges compared to previous FOI extensions. Um, the fact that this is only restricted to these public authorities insofar as they carry out certain functions. Um, and given the evidence uh, we've had, um, I'm pleased to see the Information Commissioner is, is supportive um, of this and his advice weighs heavily in our deliberations. But I'm acutely aware also that um, some of these authorities are amongst the smallest public authorities in Scotland. Um, and I'd be keen if the Minister could confirm that he will keep the um, implementation of this under close scrutiny and take account of any concerns that come forward from either requesters of information, uh, RSLs themselves, uh, the Information Commissioner um, or other, and be open to um, amending the implementation date or amending the order uh, in light of, of experience. And also, I, I do note that we're in a strange place where we passed an act um, just last year, this committee scrutinised it, the Housing Amendment Act, where we categorise RL cells as private organisations. We, we made sure they were not public authorities for the purposes um, of debt. And now we're, making, we're saying they are public authorities for the purposes of information. Now, I have no problem in principle with that, but it does create a rather um, odd um, situation which um, one day may come back to bite us, I don't know. But on the point about the, the assurance about uh, keeping this under scrutiny and making sure that this, this implementation can take place um, uh, without any problems, I'd, I'd be grateful for the Minister's comments. Uh, two points in response, Convener. Uh, can we see if there's any other comments? Yeah, Minister. Yeah. Any other comments from members? Okay. In that case, Minister, would you like to respond to that? Uh, yeah, t uh, briefly, um, there will be a review in November 2020 of how the, the implementation um, uh, uh, is, is, uh, takes place. Um, but with regard to the nine-month day, I think, I think you know, we are looking to stick to that. That is the intention. I don't envisage us moving away from that. I don't think it will be necessary to move away from that. My understanding is that within the sector there has been a lot of work done already to prepare for this and also a lot of support being offered within the sector. So the nine-month thing, I think we, we will be going for. Um, that is the, the intention. But there will be a review in November 2020. And in the meantime, I will uh, have my ear open to any issues, legitimate issues that are um, being aired. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, the question is that motion S5M15924 in the name of the Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, the, we, we are all agreed. That is agreed. The 
committee will report on the outcome of this instrument in due course. Uh, and I invite the committee to delegate authority to me as convener to approve a draft of the report for publication. Agreed? Thank you. In that case, I'll suspend briefly to allow the Minister to leave and the witness change over. Agenda item four is consideration of the new volunteer charter, which was written by Volunteer Scotland in the Trades Union Congress and launches at the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations Gathering event in February, launched at, uh, at the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations Gathering event in February 2019. And I'd like to welcome to the meeting today George Thompson, Chief Executive of Volunteer Scotland, and Dave Moxham, Deputy General Secretary, Scottish Trade Union Congress. Good morning to both of you. Right, OK, we'll start off with a question by myself, and it is, what are the main differences between the new charter and the previous version? Why has it been updated, and what is the new context mentioned in the charter? I could speak a little bit to the context and then uh, George may be to a bit of the, the detail there. So um, from our point of view, I think it's generally accepted um, uh, that the world of work is changing to some extent. So um, the headlines um, in relation to that are the, the new gig economy, the, the forging of new relationships between, if you like, the worker and the, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, and the client, for want of a better term. Um, there's also, we think, a kind of blurring between um, work and free time. So some of us are guilty of that as we uh, look at our phone every second minute to do an email when we should be relaxing. But um, th th there's other examples of that as well, where company and company time begins to reach into the, into the free time of the individual, sometimes freely given, uh, sometimes not. We also, I think, over probably more than a decade now, have um, developed our idea of um, employability. Uh, the view that there is, we would argue, um, uh, cases being made that there's an increased responsibility on the individual to have themselves work ready. We might argue from a trade union perspective that that's gone a little bit too far um, and there should be more responsibility on the employer to, um, to bring on, to develop and to support people into employment. But there's definitely uh, a changing uh, context. When we first um, wrote this charter, um, I suppose the key concerns from the trade union movement, and this was at a time of um, contracting public spending, arguably not out of that situation yet, um, and we were particularly concerned at the kind of organised replacement of um, paid labour, particularly in public service, uh, by volunteering, something which, to be fair, was taking place at a more accelerated rate down south than it was here, but we definitely saw 
some um, examples uh, of it. And then very precisely for the trade union movement as a matter of um, democracy for us, um, suggestions that volunteer labor might be used um, during uh, industrial disputes um, to replace labor, we, which we would argue uh, was strike breaking. So we had some particular concerns. But all of that was in the context of um, the trade union movement really embracing uh, volunteering as a positive thing. We are an organization that is populated by probably 20,000 volunteers. 20,000 people have some sort of position in Scotland. Um, which makes them vo named volunteers, and there's a, a large number of other people too. So wanting to be sure that all of the positives, all of the, frankly, the beauty of volunteering could be preserved and not to be contaminated by concerns, genuine concerns of workers, that their, um, that their work would disappear as a consequence of uh, the wrong application of volunteering. I'll let George um, talk maybe about the specifics, but our particular aim in the updating of the report is to, is to move on from that concern, uh, to look at some of the new forms of work and how we might protect volunteering, but protect volunteers um, and workers in that context. Thanks, David. I think, I think one of the, uh, the different emphases um, of the, the charter now is this question about what's legitimate. And I think what I've seen over the last 10 years since the first one is that there are different voices that are coming into this in a more contested space about it. So what we've seen is some really critical examples, particularly about young uh, volunteers coming in saying, we're challenging that, that we do not see that as a legitimate kind of volunteering. And that's inspired us to revisit it, strengthen it, and, and provide us a process within which people can work through looking at different stakeholders, whether or not the actual volunteering is regarded with a consensus to have some legitimacy. And I think that's a, that's a key difference in it. So it has been strengthened somewhat, but it's largely based on what we had 10 years ago. And that mirrors the, the TUC charter uh, that's operating in England, Wales, and there's also one in Northern Ireland as well. So there's a strengthening up of things. I think what it also does, it's very different to the last thing, it's, as well as it showing what we don't want, if you like, question marks about what principles that we would like to have, have you know, circumstances we'd like to avoid, there's also a very positive picture about what do we want in volunteering. And I think it's really quite significant from that point of view about uh, projecting a different kind of picture about what volunteering is, which is based on the evidence that it's largely a social networking, participative, helping out activity. And I think we've all fallen into the trap <clears throat> of over-identifying with formal roles the transactional type of volunteering, um, which we know and love, but, you know, the unsung hero kind of perspective, rather than actually seeing what it, in fact, largely is. And I think that, um, I'd finish off by saying that, then poses quite a major challenge for all of us especially with a kind of growth and inclusion agenda at play about the, the benefits of a more participative society, that we haven't been looking at those that are not involved. So this charter is an invitation not just to look at what's legitimate, but also to look at why are so many people not engaged? And let's look much more closely at them and their circumstances and find the ways in which we do, in fact, bring a more, a more participative society in Scotland. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the latter part of your, your, your uh, response because is there not a, f a fear that maybe a charter such as this might put people off volunteering unless you can sell the positives of, of volunteering? Because as you quite rightly say, it's <coughs> about what we don't want. To some extent, it's what we, we don't want volunteering to be. But Okay, if I could start off on that one, I think very strong evidence that shows us that amongst those that are least involved, because, in fact, at the moment, the, the, the sad statistic is that over half of the population in Scotland say they've never been engaged in volunteering at any time. So when they're then asked about what volunteering is, they then tend to look at the formal type of role, and it's not attractive, especially amongst those that are the least engaged and the more uh, in difficult circumstances. So the idea of unpaid work and taking on shifts and various other things is just not attractive. So from that point of view, then volunteering gets a bad name, rather than something that's actually much more social, much more engaged, much more friendly, you know, friendship building, 
solidarity, all these sort of things that we know that the benefit of volunteering brings about. So it's up to us to change the narrative and the, the communications and the listening with people to actually embrace the terms and the meanings that they have in their own contexts, rather than impose the notion of, here's what volunteering can do for you. I, I accept that. I suspect that many people volunteer without realising that's what they're doing. Likes of running football teams and stuff like that would all be part of the voluntary process. I would suggest that as somebody who used to do it for many years. Do you mind if I challenge that notion in that? I think we, we, we tend to use that as a bit of get out of jail card. And that is that we, we, we sometimes say, oh, well, we know that it's not all formal volunteering, but when you actually look at the things that we're not capturing, then there's a lot more happening. The Scottish Household Survey doesn't ask anybody if they're a volunteer. It asks them whether or not they're participating in a whole wide range of different things. So that is a really significant piece of research that gives us a great understanding of what's happening and what not. And so largely we've got this disengaged population at all levels of activity. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I wasn't talking about the information you've gathered, I'm talking about the individual not recognising the fact yeah, that Yeah, that is true in that sense, yeah. Say, Graham, you were wanting to come in? Just, just, just a quick one. Um, so just, make sure that the they're not going to be taken up by somebody else later on. Um, they certainly won't be, convener. Um, I'm just wondering if you could uh, tell us who is the, who is this charter aimed at? So um, this this charter is aimed at um, all potential parties in, for want of a better term, the, the volunteer um, transaction. So um, from George's point of view or George's organisation's point of view, it would be aimed at the organisations that he engages with who provide volunteer opportunities. Um, I imagine, I think we would probably share this, it would be aimed at all organisations that seek to promote uh, what I would describe as community empowerment so that we can, can begin to do we can begin to understand um, volunteering in terms of the collective activities that people undertake voluntarily in order to, uh, to change and improve their circumstances, and particularly, as George says, those, frankly, um, in the areas and parts of society who are less likely to engage in that community activity and that volunteering now, which, for want of a better term, is working-class um, uh, communities. Um, from our point of view, um, it's about um, empowering unions for formally to engage in discussions with something and nothing ever gets resolved by a bit of paper it yeah. only gets involved um, yeah. uh, uh, resolved by um, talking around um, a bit of paper to empower them to have those discussions in a positive rather than in a way that they always feel uh, defensive about things that might be faced with them and for the young people who we increasingly engage with that aren't part of the formal trade union movement yet <coughs> um, but through uh, campaigns like better than zero where we're having a real discussion now in scotland different from the rest of the uk um, with young people about the nature of work their expectations of work and how that fits into the their sense of themselves in wider society. So they have something to have a discussion around. Um, as I say, it ain't, it ain't a contract, right? Um, there's no such thing as a contract, but we do think that it's a, it's a tool for all of those players um, to, uh, to use to have the right sort of discussions about volunteering and how it interfaces with paid work. I would just to add to that that uh, when it came to the launch that we made um, at the gathering, uh, with a, nearly a sellout, it was about uh, 80 people that came to it and they represented all the different sectors there and um, one that stood out for me that the, the Scottish Countryside Rangers Association were present and they spoke to the Charter and spoke about how it would be a highly relevant uh, uh, document for processing their dilemmas which is about how volunteer rangers fit in alongside professional rangers and there's and i think it's a perfect example about how this could be applied there's no black and white about that context but there are real concerns about for instance you no know, adverts for for posts that would be like 37 hours for seven months for a volunteer position and they're grappling with the um, decision makers on that to get the right balance between the volunteers and the professionals and have publicly stated they would use the charter as a means to assist them to do that. Okay, thank you. Andy? Uh, thanks very much, um, Convener. You talk in the charter about volunteering based on the UN definitions, um, and you go on to say, we envisage this charter will be most relevant in formal service. So that's where people are on the board of a, a charity or 
things like that. What, what do you define as formal service? Well, I would say you know that that would be more like the ranger example I've just given. You know that they would have uh, you know almost a contracted role to be a volunteer ranger with training and responsibilities and set times and various other. So that would be the formal service. Now it, it can cover all elements of what we typically see in uh, you know charity shops, befriending drivers, you know sports coaches. All of these kind of roles would be um, where the person would clearly know that they're a volunteer, name themselves, I'm a volunteer coach at the swimming, and that would be a formal service activity. I think what the point we're trying to get across is that, in fact, that is very much the minority of what volunteer activity is, but we've become quite fixated on those, on those roles rather than actually all the kind of helping out and more if you like, less formal roles that we have to engender much more of. But you're saying this charter will be most relevant in formal service volunteering well, context? And the reason for that is that the, the area where there's been contention with regard to displacement is in where it's unpaid work type uh, uh, positions. And that's where it's most relevant to guide people through, is this role um, you know, a legitimate one or is it one that actually could be criticised for displacing somebody that was previously a worker in this you know, setting. Okay, so in, in a sense this is not targeted at volunteering as a whole, it's taking, it's focusing on where the problems have occurred and trying to resolve them. In many respects, I did come up, in many respects it is, but it is, like I said earlier, that it is also about what we want as well as what we don't want. So it is trying to project um, you know, um, a focus around growth and inclusion is how I would put it. And can this help us to shift our way of thinking about that to be more expansive, as well as protecting workers and volunteers from exploitation where, where that might be a risk? Okay, and you say in the Charter that this, um, this formal service volunteering context, you say this is where there has been, you talk about recruitment, management, induction, etc. This is where there has been legal uh, challenges and conflict can you say a little bit more about the nature of those legal challenges, sort of examples? Or? Um, yes, um, I'm not going to give um, very specific examples, but I'll give examples which are specific enough to, to elicit, um, uh, hopefully, the information. So, obviously, when somebody enters into a voluntary um, uh, um, a voluntary relationship with somebody who also acts as um, an employer and contracts, although it's not an employment contract, to do that work. Um, there can be, and there have been questions arise, uh, arising as to whether that um, essentially evades minimum wage legislation. So you are, to an extent, asking somebody to work a number of hours and you are saying that you won't pay them and they are voluntarily agreeing to do that. That doesn't necessarily make an employer of an authority um, uh, exempt from uh, um, a range of employment legislation, but minimum wage would be uh, the most likely. So where we have been able to identify that we think that that cuts across minimum wage legislation and therefore a minimum wage legislation breach might be taking place, we have tended to use that um, as the way to, shall we say, discourage what we consider to be a, um, a, a, a bad volunteering um, situation. What this charter would do, in a sense, um, is it, um, if it's adhered to, would make that a safer situation so that less employers um, contracting voluntary um, workers would, would, would be likely to fall foul of minimum wage or other other employment legislation. There have actually been legal challenges on this that have led to re a resolution in the law? On um, there have been um, companies who have decided to stop doing what they're doing as a consequence of our um, uh, uh, legal letters and, and legal approaches. Okay, but there's no cases <coughs> actually come to court? No, I mean, there's this and other areas um, of, of uh, legislation, including uh, trial shifts and others sit in a, in a particularly grey area. So trial shifts would be a, a good example of where there's an understanding of where, in a very extreme example, a, a free trial shift would fall foul of legislation, but there's no, um, there's no definition of how long a trial shift should be. In, 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 indeed, uh, um, uh, uh, Stuart, Stuart MacDonald, MP uh, uh, from Glasgow, actually tried 
decide to introduce legislation uh, in, in, in Westminster to try and clarify the situation. But volunteering would be similar in the sense that there's not a lot of test cases out there. Um, there is a general understanding that there's the, the risk that, 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 bad, that, that bad volunteering could run across there, but no, no test cases that I'm aware of. And do you envisage, given that you've said that this has <clears throat> already, or your engagement with people who um, employ volunteers has already uh, led to them stopping doing things that they probably shouldn't be, uh, do you envisage that this could develop into some kind of an accreditation scheme, um, rather like, you know, minimum wage employer, you could say, um, you know, volunteering Scotland, volunteer Scotland, uh, employer. I'm just thinking, for example, my, you know, my, my, my daughter volunteered for Celtic Connections. Um, looking after artists and stuff. She wasn't paid, um, but many young people will volunteer for music festivals and things like that, typically. Uh, they'll get fed and watered. Uh, they might even get accommodation, though that's rare. Uh, they'll get free ticket um, for the rest of the weekend. Um, is that one of the places where, A, there might be a bit of a grey area in terms of compliance, and B, whether a accreditation scheme might help to um, deliver the charter? <clears throat> we certainly use it as a form of accreditation on the online uh, national database for volunteering so that we ask for any organisation that wants to promote its opportunities to agree with the charter principles. So in that sense, there's a, a form of accreditation there. It's a good question in helping us maybe get across that we see this very much as a guide and as a process for looking at what's the motivation, for example. So if the motivation behind a, a role is clearly there about the, the fundraising and the, um, the mutual support that's around, it then will not become a question. But if the motivation, and it doesn't matter who it is and it can change, if the motivation is to prevent paying for somebody when that should be the actual, the, the, you know, the, 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 the better approach to it, then that can raise questions about the legitimacy of it. And we can't really foretell what the circumstances are, it does become a matter of trust and the different parties that come to play when looking at this question. And all we're saying is that we're seeing in this last period a lot of interest coming from outside the normal quarters to say, well, we're looking at that and not really seeing why would you um, not pay for that role when you paid for it last year? Why would you set up over 100 volunteer opportunities when before they were paid? And it's a question clear that's coming Clear breach in. of the charter. Clear, that would be a clear breach of, uh, of uh, principle five. Yeah. Yeah. So that can be well evidenced. Yes. Whether there's been a breach, yeah. yeah. Now, on the question of, um, I suppose, uh, to what extent this is a kind of um, a standard or a mechanism, um, uh, I suppose I, I might make a comparison with something like the Fair Work Framework, where there are aspects of the Fair Work framework um, where um, it would be very, very clear if that was breached. So we're looking, just for context, we're looking for public service employers and other employers, and, and many have to adopt the Fair Work Framework because it outlines um, a number of ways in which we think um, you know, public and, and, and authorities and other employers should act. That's not as enforceable as something which would sit under um, uh, you know, the black and white of procurement legislation or certainly anything that's covered by uh, by employment law. Um, but it is something that we believe um, it's, a, it's a legitimate question to ask of anybody who offers these opportunities and why they haven't adopted it and whether they believe that they can legitimately describe themselves as offering volunteer opportunities if George's organisation and my organisation on the back of the chart I haven't said haven't said that it is. So yeah, it, it's short of a um, uh, um, uh, short of a rulemaking uh, mechanism, but um, we think a useful one in terms of asking people to, to increasingly adopt it as a way of judging whether uh, their opportunities are significant. I think what we're seeing in a positive sense is that uh, still in council um, has made a, a very ambitious target to achieve a 50% participation rate. So to move quite significantly, it's already at 36, but in particular the, the kind of quintile one areas are way down at 16%. So it's made this you know, big um, commitment and it's working really hard strategically to look at ways in which it could bring that about. So it's signed up for the Charter. And it's doing that on the basis of establishing the trust between all the parties that its motivation 
is not to come in and do a displacement approach. And that is quite a big charge, the distrust about well, why would a council be trying to develop more volunteering? Is it just a means by which it's, um, you know, saving on its, on, its, on its financial difficulties? So I think it can also be used at the outset in that kind of process is to say, we're buying into this, that's where we're coming from, we're building trust and we're going to work a whole variety of different ways in which volunteering can manifest itself and not fall into the trap of looking at it as a displacement activity. I wonder if uh, there was one point that, um, uh, that uh, uh, Andy Whitehead uh, mentioned that I was just going to talk about. That's specifically things like music festivals. It's a really, it's a really interesting example for us. And the principle here is obviously lots and lots of people, largely young people, not all pe young people, do enter into that arrangement for want, want of a better term. Um, transport to sometimes um, and uh, free access to a gig in return for you know two eight hour shifts over a period of two days um, so from our point of view the fact that the individual concerned has voluntarily consented to that doesn't obviate the, the examination of further issues if we would if we saw um, a, you know, a large profit making company um, uh, with Questionable, uh, um, uh, uh, questionable ability to describe itself as simply undertaking that function for the public good, they were making a profit, um, then we would still say that there were questions to be asked of that company and there are still potentially circumstances in which they could fall into the grey area of the law we talked about earlier. Where we think this chart comes in useful, but where there also needs to be discussion around those things is, from our point of view, that would be different from the Commonwealth Games. So I mean, George yeah. will be able to tell me how many people volunteer for the Commonwealth Games, but it was like 13,000. 13, I, I knew it was a double figures of thousands, but I thought I might be guilty of, um, of exaggerating that. Um, is that the same, and is that the same in all circumstances for a, a large money-making commercial festival choosing to um, uh, uh, employ its bar workers through a voluntary mechanism. We would say not necessarily, um, and there's things in here around profit and common good and motivation that allows that to be explored, and we think that that's really important. Well, I think maybe a, a good example to illustrate the points there, that when you look at the Ryder Cup, now, the Ryder Cup was a great volunteering experience, but there were some rules in there which were about shop assistants being volunteers. And those shop assistants were selling the merchandise and they would breach the eighth principle. Now, it's really good to say that for the Solheim Cup coming up in September, of which we are very closely involved in sporting that, that's been stopped. So there's been a shift. There's been a, you know, a move away from saying that's not the right kind of activity. But we will continue to have all our stewards. There's going to be a big youth engagement this time and it's going to be a more inclusive games than or a tournament than before so there's a lot of really good changes that are happening there and that's one that i think is a specific example of how the the charter is saying that's not acceptable you shouldn't you shouldn't have a volunteer merchandise worker selling a, you know t-shirts for private profit in in a context like that and that's been accepted the, the principles of this is nobody would really disagree with that. But if I can maybe make, just raise a couple of points for you. One is where you talked about displacement. If you, if you look at what's been happening in a lot of local authority services over the last number of years, um, the areas that have taken the biggest cuts is, is areas like the local environment. So the parks department has most parks departments and most local authorities will have taken massive cuts in terms of the numbers of workers that they actually have. And you can see that across a whole range of areas. Uh, is the danger not that, that as, as, as that gap appears in terms of public services, it's increasingly being filled by volunteers? So they're not directly replacing jobs, but indirectly they are. And in terms of the deal for the the volunteers themselves. I mean, you talk about effective structures being in place to support and train and develop. Should volunteers for its large organisations not have some kind of rights that they understand clearly what it is that they're going to get from the process and in terms of employability, for example, what skills they're going to have? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I think that's a good point. 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 I think
Could I do the first bit on, uh, uh, yeah. and you do the second bit? Um, uh, uh, thanks, Alec. Um, the, there is that risk, and you and I are both long enough in the truth in terms of local government to see, most of us are to see that um, local services sometimes disappear from, for reasons of, of, of budget cuts, and we both will have witnessed circumstances in which, in order to fill that gap, communities have got together and worked to replace that particular service. Now, um, to suggest that this charter um, should make a definitive it should take a definitive view on where a community left to its own resources through, you know, for what we would argue were, were, were bad budgetary and fiscal decisions, should, if you like, be unable to do anything about that, to create their new facility, to work together to do that. I think, I th I think that's, well beyond, that's well, well beyond the realms of this charter. I think where it is relevant, um, and, and remember, this, those are the aspects of this charter happened around 2009, 2010, when particular ideas were being promulgated as policy, that there were sections of public service that could, should no longer be funded because they could, the responsibility for that uh, provision should be passed to the community um, is a slightly different thing. So it, it's a different thing, and you know, making no comment on the individual decisions that councillors, council, uh, councils, and other public service providers have to make when a service gets cut. It's a different thing to uh, support a community resilient, resilience when that happens than it is to make your um, strategic and budgetary decisions based upon a policy view that that's what should happen. So the idea that you decide not to provide any libraries anymore because you can just get the community to do them is a bad thing. The idea that if a service does go and the community decides and is supported in some way to, um, to make alternative arrangements, I think the idea that that should not happen would be, would be, beyond, uh, would be beyond the practice and the, um, uh, and the, uh, um, uh, the scope of this. Uh, this is maybe where I slightly differ a little bit in terms of what you're saying here, David, in the sense that, I mean, I remember a conversation with Carnegie, uh, and this has gone back a few years, but why, why was it that some uh, library closures generated um, trust and resolution, and why in other settings did it lead to conflict and protest and difficulty? And we didn't really have the answer to that, but we, we, we guessed that the circumstances were very much about the motivation, about the information that was shared, and about the different you know, uh, negotiations at play. And, and I'd like to think that this is a guide for negotiations as much as anything, rather than it's a black and white martyr. So you can have a situation where the protest continues, you know, we're not having this library closure, and you, or you can actually legitimately have a, s a circumstance where some people are wanting to play a role. I know in an Ayrshire library, there's a group of 20 volunteers that do all the IT support, you know, or, or not so much IT support, but IT hand, you know, help to, to uh, the people coming in using it. So you can find a, a, a mutuality in there. And it's really just a matter of, can we work through the reality of the circumstances we're in, build the trust between workers and, and volunteers and the, the different players and find the right resolution, but not fall foul of a temptation, perhaps, that if we think we can save some uh, money on the basis of wages because we can transfer that to another, then I think that's where people have to come to their own conclusions. No, that's not legitimate and we're not accepting that. But it's, it is a grey area, that one. Mm -hmm. And what about the... My other point, which is in terms of should should volunteers have some kind of rights in terms of being told, you know, about almost like an individual learning plan, an individual oh. training plan, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I think yeah, and we I think we do give recognition to that about good treatment and support and safety, um, and it absolutely would agree to that. I think the only thing is the word rights have got an emotive element to them, and I certainly where I come from, I would I would avoid the temptation to, to talk about volunteer rights, because that then starts to move us into that territory of seeing volunteering as an unpaid work paradigm. <clears throat> when, as I said earlier, the vast majority of us volunteer in a helping out context. So rights doesn't quite work in that sense. So absolutely, uh, taking good care, good uh, management, good practice with volunteers is of its essence. But I wouldn't move it into rights per se. 
Thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Annabelle. Thank you. Convener, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, just picking up on that broad area, I mean, when we're looking at gaps, if you like, potential gaps in state provision, um, I happened to visit uh, an open day coffee morning of the Cowdenbeath Food Bank the other Saturday, and they have impressively some 30 volunteers, and that is very much in the helping out vein that George Thompson spoke about, uh, where there's a failure in the safety net of the social security system of the state. Uh, and so that is very much a helping out uh, uh, activity that is going on and great credit to all of those involved. Um, looking to the promulgation of the charter, um, what do you envisage in terms of information awareness raising, both for volunteers, for those who will have volunteers working uh, alongside the paid workers, for paid workers in employment? How do you see this rolling out in terms of people being aware of it, because it's all very well for it to be there, but if actually people are not aware of it, that would be a pity. But also, it occurs to me that from the volunteering side, and I used to sit on the CPG and on volunteering uh, in this parliament, um, that this actually could be a recruiting sergeant, to use that phrase, um, for volunteers, uh, because it is, it's, it's, it's taking the debate on a bit, and it's, it's interesting, and you know, it sets a, a kind of parameter around which their activities can be performed. So uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I, I, right away, I would say I was really delighted that um, your, your own cabinet secretary, Eileen Camp, uh, Campbell, will be launching any day now uh, a new volunteering outcomes framework. <clears throat> and that's um, its, its key phrase is volunteering for all. And much of what we've been saying here is absolutely coterminous with that. And it's, uh, it's a real effort to, to look at a shift in the mindset and activities. So I think uh, that will be a, a real good shot in the arm within which this is an enabling uh, type of uh, support. So the other thing I would say um, is that it has generated a lot of connections with us. So we've had just the other day, uh, Volunteer Glasgow has met and discussed it with their own um, constituency and have offered to work with us to generate more case studies. And I think that's going to be an important part of the sharing of it. So the principles are here, but how do you bring it to life by giving examples of different settings? And how, in some cases, has that run foul of the principles and how, in other settings, has it applied it? So you're absolutely right. I think we, um, we will be looking at, in some senses, the encouragement of this committee meeting today, as well as a, as a part of that. Uh, getting the feedback uh, to us about the value of this, and we will we will absolutely ha have our uh, plans in place for uh, moving it out over over this next year, fitting in with a number of different things. And the gathering itself was a was a major launch pad, uh, and got a good bit of coverage. Thank you. And, and Dave, do you have any comments from your uh, Yeah. So I mean, I suppose there's the um, uh, if you like. There's a structural influence and um, uh, promoting it through the structures. And you know, it's worth pointing out this place. Um, I mean, VDS does is the portal for an awful lot of those volunteering opportunities anyway. So the, the, the fact that it simply exists and that um, that these organisations already refer to VDS is a you know is a fairly big step in in terms of, of its use. Um, we will obviously promote it so that our um, branches and so that um, uh, those organisations that we have that interface with employers um, are aware of it. And as you suggest, in a positive way so that we're able to say which you know, uh, back to the convener's point about um, uh, do we know that we're do we know that we're volunteering so that all of these people who were involved in these discussions around the interface in volunteering and work realize that they are themselves volunteers that they are doing um, uh, valuable work so we, we would look to do that uh, we also have an extensive range of um, school visits that we undertake from a trade union point of view where again we talk about the kind of nature of work and uh, the rights and responsibilities it is at work and this is something that will incorporate into that so that young people are hearing from trade unionists about the positive value of volunteering 
And I think that that's particularly important because I do think that there is, um, a, a, in some cases, a growing expectation that young people will somehow produce themselves as work ready before they've even had a job. That they will, that, you know, my daughter, um, you know, my daughter of her own volition decided that she wanted to go and work um, in a charity shop on a Saturday morning. And that was great. Um, and she wanted to do it partly because she supported the charity, but she was also acutely aware that it wasn't going to be unhelpful for her when she went for her first uh, university and uh, other job interviews. So again, not, I really do think it's important that we get this right for kind of young people as they're considering the interface between their voluntary activity and work and the, the, the stuff that we can do there. Uh, the other way we'd like to promote this, frankly, is um, through um, uh, local authorities and people who are writing up um, contracts, particularly contracts for... Um, events so that when they're laying out procurement contracts which include community benefit and some of that community benefit is going to be really important that there's a clear understanding of what community benefit means both for the volunteer and the wider community and that that contracts for major events are written in such ways that they're um, that they're consistent with this okay. that's very interesting just one last minor point mm -hmm. um so what about business though so fsb and other uh, larger business organizations because it would be important to ensure that they were aware of, of this in terms of the paid worker uh, aspect to it. Is, are there plans afoot for that engagement? Or perhaps it's already taken place. There are now. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, I think uh, as long as I've been involved in this, uh, we've, we've spoken about employer-supported volunteering. And um, it is a bit of a sleeping giant, but the... the the problem is that the actual facts show that very few people source their volunteering activity with the help of their employers. And I think given that the major break and the major reason why people stop volunteering is the time pressures on them, I think we've got a, a lot more to do to embrace the commercial side and employers into the common good agenda about how they can help facilitate more time for their workforce to take part in community things and for us to move away from that more, you know, parody challenge Annika type of activities, which is all too common as well, the team things, you know, the paint in the classroom type of thing. And, and I'm afraid that too much of the thinking is based on that rather than a more modern approach to engagement. And so I think we've, we've got a big job to do to, to shift that one as things stand. So yes, it's here as, a, as, as something that's an aid for commercial companies as they look at, like festivals and other places, and that is a factor. But for participation in Scotland as a whole, the, um, the numbers are very low. Okay. Can I, can I, can I? It's, it's, uh, on that point, is there not a couple of uh, some of the larger organisations that do quite good work around about that, where they give their <coughs> staff a day a month, or well, I'm not sure what it is, but that go out there, so is there, would they not be able to help you to sell it, the benefits of that to, to yeah. other companies? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not the paragon of all the ideas about how to deal with this. All I, all I can say is that I mean, my own company, Volunteer Scotland, has got the three days uh, availability for staff, and there's not a great take up in my own Sorry. company. So I, I can't really you know, criticise others, but what, what I would say is that, that that approach doesn't work. So what, what we're seeing is, and I suppose back to earlier thought, I move away from transactions to relationships. If you are building relationships amongst staff, things like the walk into work, the wonderful you know, step challenge, getting teams to do things and getting out and about and, and that kind of activity, I think that's got a lot going for it. But the transactional side, it doesn't, it just doesn't relate to, I've got a day um, to take in the, in, in, in the year. It's not a great take up. Okay, and challenge Annika, seriously. <laughs> no, sorry, <laughs> showing my age. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, <that. laughs> okay. sorry, Annabelle. You... Uh, no, that's fine. Thank you very much. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham? I'm, I'm just wondering what challenge Annika actually is. Oh, oh, yeah. never, never heard of it. Never heard of it. No misinformation in this. <laughs> it's just because uh, he didn't have a telly. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just thinking about what you've just been discussing with the convener um, and thinking about my own experience. I uh, um, used to work um, for the uh, Scottish Sun and uh, that that company had um, probably the kind of volunteering setup that you, you're 
not in favour of George um, because they, they they would give you um, uh, probably a day a day every couple of months if, and, and and they would organise things like I mean I took part in some tree tree planting in in Glasgow but you know I suppose that that's a bit like fence painting and you know it's the sort of thing that it's just a one-off it's not it's a, it's not a regular thing um you don't need to answer that i'm just rem, 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 reminiscing um dave you you um mentioned procurement um and there are a number of uh, organizations who get public contracts but who also have volunteers uh, and the S scvo has, has made some comments on this and they, they advocate that such organizations who want government support must offer proper contracts um, uh, not zero hours contracts and pay the living rate living wage um, have, you, have you got any thoughts about you know how government should tackle all this um, yeah, well, obviously we've got a big shopping list in terms of um, uh, uh, um, standards that should be laid down um, for um, procuring companies, um, obviously with respect to their employed staff. I mean, very much, I, mean, I would very much like to see this charter being adopted by companies, being insisted upon um, by procurers um, uh, for companies um, who... Uh, um, who um, deliver volunteering, um, d d delivering volunteering as part of a, a part of a wider contract? Um, we're certainly not taking the view, and I'm not sure if it was the point of your question that um, uh, companies using volunteers shouldn't get um, procurement contracts, or that it should be insisted that they should. Um, I think you know. I think there's a there's there's a mixed economy of kind of um, a provision when it comes to that. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't really get the other point. point. Um, I suppose what they were saying is um, it, maybe when government or councils are, mm -hmm. are, are handing out contracts to organisations that have a large body of volunteers, maybe those contracts should... It'd be more specific about what's required. Oh, I mean, we would, we would absolutely. I mean, we would absolutely support that. Um, and you know, and to be fair, um, in a lot of the environments where um, where we do observe a lot of volunteers, there are, you know, there are. You know, it's not the it's not the rights that Alec Rowley talked about, but there are clear expectations, rights and responsibilities um, laid down, uh, both in terms of um, safety, both in terms of um, supervision, um, uh, a, a whole range of things. So, should that be stipulated? I would say yes, but I wouldn't want to pretend that it doesn't currently exist because there's many, many f fairly positive examples of where those relationships work and work quite well. All I would say is that back to the question of motivations, which you can never really answer in an abstract, <clears throat> but we'd, you know, we're not clearly not saying that there's not a role for volunteers. We want more volunteers to be coming in and, and, and helping and providing a service. But if the motivation for that engagement is to have a competitive edge over another contractor because of savings that you incur in there, then that opens up questions for the, uh, that system to say, is that a legitimate way forward on it? If the motivation is about engagement and about the well-being and, uh, and the community interest in what's happening, that could shift the judgment. If, if, if I might say, because you, you did also ask um, about the role of companies and you gave the example of the tree planting day off. Um, yeah. uh, um, I mean... The, the trees are still alive, apparently. Are they? Yes. Are they? Yeah. Well, um, uh, I think what I'd be saying there is, I mean, <laughs> no disagreement in principle with the idea that a company says, you know, let's all go off for a day um, and do this instead of work. Although it begins to get a bit close to, is that volunteering or not? We're going to give you a day off so that yeah. you can volunteer yeah. to do something that we want you to do. It doesn't quite kind of do it for me. I think what's more important in terms of the flexibility um, is, is companies recognising that people do things out there for the common good. Now, that can be everything from sitting on a children's panel all the way through to things. They may not, it probably ceases to be volunteering if you're saying, 
we're going to give you three days off to do that. But there are flexibilities which are really, really important in that. So we may, I may not be asking for any additional hours to go and do my <coughs> volunteering, but I might be asking for flexible hours so that I can go and do this on a particular on a particular morning, because as we know, um, you know, nine to five doesn't always doesn't always assist with, with such things. So I think where I think employers and particularly the private sector could look look at this is to say, how do we support the volunteering activities of our em employees through providing the type of flexibilities that recognise that this 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 is a public good and that it should be promoted. Yeah, make a point just mm. to supplement that. I think uh, <coughs> one of the difficulties. I know my ex chair Bill Howitt gave evidence to one of your committees and he, he shared with me um, what had happened then. And one of the things that uh, strikes me that the, the, the commercial sector tend to look at volunteering as a charity thing. So they look for charitable possibilities to go and do some work which I was thinking, mistakenly, largely, I know I'm generalising, but it's mistakenly that there's a need for them. And there's good evidence and good research to show that that becomes a burden on most charities when a group say, we want 10 or 12 of our team to come and do some work with you. And they think that you know, all that can be done without cost. So there is a shift now in the thinking and, and, and amongst the companies as well to say, like, this is not really that meaningful. So how can we get more meaningful activities all around? And I'd like to think this can help us to start shifting the ground into more community building, community relationships, finding out about your community where the company is based, rather than thinking, oh, there's a poor charity that requires our day's activity and they'll thank us from you know, the high heavens because of what we've gone and done. I know I'm exaggerating, but I, I, you know, it's a bit like that. I com completely agree with you. It's this kind mm. of thing that looks good in the company newsletter. Mm. Uh, make, makes the company feel good about itself. Yeah. Uh, but doesn't maybe actually provide any long-term help. Can I move away from the third sector and ask you, it's probably directed at you, Dave, um, what's your view on the, u uh, the use of uh, in internships? Um, MSPs use interns occasionally. Um, we're, um, again, I'm not even sure if this is a grey area, um, we're, we're against unpaid internships. Um, we don't... Um, uh, we don't see that as being uh, necessary. Um, we think that there's plenty of ways, and the SGC is about to agree, um, you know, a very well-structured um, internship, which is essentially paid by the, the funding organisation. And so providing opportunities, genuine opportunities, we think is a good thing. Um, I think the, the concern about unpaid internships is, internships is fairly well rehearsed. They're more available to people of certain financial means than they are. Um, than they are to others. Um, so we're, we're against unpaid internship. All I would add to that is that any, any volunteer activity which uh, requires a lot of hours to be given starts to shift it away from the norm or what we would normally see as volunteering. It shifts it into a different domain. So it's not to say that it's necessarily wrong, but it's something that would, would uh, take further attention towards it. Can I just turn that round slightly? Um, so say you've got, I know in, the, in, in terms of the Scottish Parliament, you will get, um, say, a, uni a university will, will approach uh, Parliament, um, MSPs, and say, look, we've got uh, the X number of students who, as part of their course, uh, we would like them to spend time in, a, in an MSP's office. We're not asking you to pay them. It's part of their course, uh, and at the end of it, they'll they'll produce something, and it's short term. Is there anything wrong wrong with that? Yeah, in, in you know, if the MSP is you're not looking for anyone in particular, you're just helping someone out. Uh, no, yeah, sorry. Let me let me be clear. If it's part of a structured educational opportunity. Um, and one presumes that due diligence will have been done on such structured educational opportunities. We would make a differentiation between that and somebody who was saying, come and work for free for us for three months, um, not as part of a structured educational opportunity. Right. So we would make, in general terms, again, not going to be say that every single one of those is fine, but in general terms, we'd make a distinction between a, a structured educational opportunity and, uh, um, and you know, a general come and work for us for free for your own advantage in the long term kind of arrangement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 
actually going to say, say something very similar to Graham actually. I mean, I'm, I'm 100% of my staff budget's committed. So if I was to take an intern on it, it could only be on that basis really because otherwise, you know, you're, you're effective, you, you would have to make room, you know, from the salaries of your existing, uh, existing staff. But the, the, uh, Dave earlier on touched without mentioning on the big society, which uh, was an idea which sank uh, uh, without trace. It, it came from... Um, of course, uh, Dave, where is he now? Uh, Cameron, <laughs> uh, back in the day. I think now everyone uh, um, accepts that volunteering really should be uh, should grow, but not at the expense of paid employment. And what you're looking to do is for, for both paid employment and volunteering to grow without, with, and minimise the overlap, um, I, I would suggest. So f from my perspective, you know, I think it's about how you really manage that and minimise that overlap with... Uh, and it's about how you really try and address it without, um, I mean, conflict. I mean, for example, you've said, you've said here, for example, that the Charter is a tool for conflict resolution and addressing media interests. I'm just wondering if there's any practical examples. I mean, you talked, for example, about, about country ranges. Are there any other kind of examples of how that would uh, work? And just one other thing I would say is um, when you talk about employers uh, assisting volunteers, one obvious one is, is uh, employers, for example, allowing um, people time off work to crew a lifeboat. For example, which is a which is a, a, a very important community uh, aspect. A few things. I'm, I'm going to get you started in, in this. That um, <clears throat> one thing that struck me about a big society was it, it was uh, it was also a, a kind of statement that the state is withdrawn, and so more will will fall upon you. And and in that sense, it, it didn't work. But I think that the counter side of this is to say that. There is a real willingness in our population to engage and do things, and it's absolutely palpable. I did myself some door knocking. I went around 400 different doors. I spoke to 100 people in five different communities, and well over half were willing to be part of something. So I think it's local government, the local state, community planning have a far greater responsibility than they're currently undertaking to generate the circumstances for that community participation and common good. And we have got to really do a lot more on that front and not over rely on the charity sector to be the place that uh, brings things in. Um, so I've made my soapbox point, and I can't remember the question to actually <laughs> yeah, rambling to, to, it was to come in more on that. Around a few houses. Steve. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a... a, a just two almost diametrically opposed ways of looking at, if you like, the big society and what, what we should mean by the big society. So you mentioned him. So I will say David Cameron, as, as, as Jill suggested, was talking about the withdrawing of the state. And we all know, or I think most of us would agree, that the withdrawing of the state, leaving a degree of resilience amongst those who are most organised, frankly, best off and in the communities where that was possible to do. Hold these up as shining examples. And then why ask why other people in, in, in other communities with other levels of resource and resilience are unable to do it. And you also almost get into this kind of blame dynamic of people need to stand on their own two feet because, look, the, frankly, the poshers around the corner are managing to do it. Um, there is another way of looking that, at that, which is that that level of community resilience working together um, should actually be engendered and it should start in the working class communities in our, in, in our towns and cities. So that, and I'll, I'll give my example, you know, I'm, I'm a, a member of an allotment. Um, uh, I get to do quite a lot of things um, as a member of a you know, 40 strong allotment with a committee. We, there are certain things that we take responsibility for. We go out, we do uh, food initiatives with the local community, school, um, schools come in to see us. It's within a framework that is supported and promoted by the local authority. So some of that is done by the local authority um, and they make um, grants and support and others sometimes to do it well sometimes not so well but that's always a dynamic between um, community and uh, uh, community organizations and local authorities but as a framework it works because they are putting their resource into an area that needs it they are promoting us to do additional things um, but it's correctly targeted and for me that's diametrically opposite from saying we're not going to fund um, uh, allotments anymore but we know that the ones in the west end of Glasgow are going to manage to stay on their feet but the ones but the ones in the in the east end and the north of Glasgow probably won't 
I mean, I mean, I think I think what you've touched on is a really a really important issue: community capacity and resilience. Because even my own constituency, there are huge differences. Um, for example, when a community organisation some years ago was set up, there, there weren't the, 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 the retired professionals, if we if we if we want to put it that way, who had the time and the experience and all that uh, to commit to making some of these projects work. And I think it's it's difficult sometimes to get significant projects off the ground um, without that level of community capacity. So how do we how do we extend and boost community capacity and resilience so that all communities can can gain from from volunteering, George? So many different elements to that, of course. Um, but one for us is that uh, our take on this is that we think we have to create starting points for people to meet, perhaps sometimes for the first time in a neighbourhood to actually meet and discuss the community context that they're in. So we've been experimenting with a thing called, we call it community bubbles. And uh, it's a wonderful tent and everything else. I don't have the time, you don't have the time to hear more about that. But we've been taking it to Tillicutri. Um, it's going to Brussels, of all places. But more importantly, in the Stirling-based work, it's going to be our outreach effort to go into those communities and um, find legitimacy for that first point, which might be some survey work or photography, community radio type things to get some generate some interest and get people actually talking about the community spirit of their place what builds it and what detracts from it and then from that dialogue to work out what they could connect with if it's a group of guys that could connect with the local men shed we can make that reference but if it's about what's happened in <coughs> Tillicuri about drugs work about well drugs conduct it's about festivity and it's also about the housing management. So there's three different things that have emerged from those um, community bubble events. So there's three different uh, groups that are working on these different elements and we're nurturing that and seeing where that goes. So starting points, I think, is of the essence. An issue for me, I've found in my own constituency, and I'm sure it's an issue in many others, is that when you look, for example, the lottery grants, you know, you put in awards for all, 70% oh. chance of getting a grant up to £10,000. You go for the major projects, only 6 or 7% are successful. That's because community groups are sometimes expected to put together one or 200 page, oh. you know, business plans and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And <coughs> frankly, not everyone's got the time and the experience the ability to, to, to do that. Um, and that, may, that sometimes <coughs> holds back major projects. I would just say, uh, in terms of that, I think that's a fair point. <coughs> but uh, there's another way of looking at it, and that is that... We're a very rich uh, nation, which where there are ideas that people want to, uh, let's just say that group wants to set up a recovery cafe, I think they will find the resources around to help them to do that. So it's not so much for me the question of finding resources to do the things you want. It's whether or not you get people together to have the ideas in the first place and they, they work out for themselves what it is that's important. And I think we have got a crisis in our hands and the stats show it. <coughs> that like in Perth and Kinross and Stirling, you've got in Quintile 5, the better areas, half the population invo involved in volunteering. And in Quintile 1, in, in Perth, <coughs> it's right down to 13%. And in Stirling, where we're working, it's 16% below the national average. So it's not that people are any different, actually. It's that the circumstances have not been brought about in, across the, uh, the, the playing field to find ways in which we listen or are humble and listening to where people are at and what makes sense to them and work it out from them. So it's a long journey, but it's encouraging when you give that opportunity. Last question, convener for me. Um, I was a member of the predecessor committee this 20 years ago and we did a major inquiry into volunteering and one of the things that the recommendations was that, um, that uh, public agencies um, should be funded for three years and yet we still have an issue in which that is a, a problem. So um, I wonder if you, either of you could comment on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's so many reasons um, to go for a more um, stable, long-term and assured funding me uh, mechanism for the delivery of public services out with the direct sector that you know, volunteering is, is only one of those. Um, but, I mean, absolutely, if you want organisations to provide services and also to have plans, which would include plans for how they engage with communities and how they um, you know, develop strong, robust volunteer policies, 
then security of funding is going to be a major component in that. I wouldn't pretend that that's just about volunteering. As I say, I can think of um, a, a list full of reasons why that should be the case, but I would certainly agree with you. Okay. 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 I'll just move on. Thanks. Uh, Alexander? Thank you, Daniel. You know, we've talked about the benefits today of volunteering, and there is no doubt uh, that individuals who give over their time and their talent to support whatever uh, volunteering sector that it's, that is immense. And, you know, f myself, I've volunteered all my adult life, uh, and I'm still volunteering on a weekly basis. And I think the benefits that you can put back into the community have been shown. You know, individuals are, are, are given accolades. I've had an accolade for my uh, volunteering uh, in, in, in the past, uh, uh, and, and I think that's fantastic. But that's not the reason I volunteered, but that came with, the, with the doing the work uh, and being co commended and congratulated for it. But I think one of the big sectors we now have today is social enterprise. That has become a much bigger part uh, of our economy, of our structure. Uh, and these social enterprises are there uh, because they want to, uh, in part, and individuals want to become involved. But they are businesses to some extent. Uh, and the, 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 they, they plough back their funds back into uh, the community or into the social enterprise. But when we look at it as, as an enterprise, and I think for both your organisations, how can we ensure uh, that people who are part of that social enterprise, uh, they, are, they are not being used uh, to, to financially uh, support the management or, or the, the owners of these enterprises in going forward? Because, as I say, that, that whole sector uh, has now become much, much more uh, prevalent in our, in our economy. Well, I would come in and say it's a, it's a good challenge, this. It's an area that we have not really looked enough at, and that's something I would certainly take away uh, from today, to look at the case studies and, and to seek out some social enterprise settings within which we look at volunteer participation. That's the overall uh, agenda. We want to increase that, and social enterprises are clearly a good opportunity for that increase in participation to occur. However, the point you're making is that there, that can come with some difficulties with, as well. So uh, I don't know enough about that because I haven't focused on that to be able to give you a better answer, but I'm very happy to look at that as a case study in future. Thank you. I, I, I do think it, I'm not saying this is um, a mistake you're making, but I think it's important that we make a clear distinction between what we call the voluntary sector, by which we mean, we mean the third and non-profit making sector and volunteering. They, they share a word, um, but obviously we have very, very large third sector organisations that don't, um, they don't have any volunteers at all. They're simply um, service providers no particular argument with that but sometimes we can think that there's a kind of more of a crossover than there really is between the non-profit making uh, motive and the provision of, of volunteer services and as we've discussed they, they, they cut across um, all sectors I mean I think you know when you're talking about um, uh, uh, social enterprise organizations you know my, the first question and it's in the charter here essentially is is the organization making a profit um, and is it making a profit because of the work that its volunteers are doing because clearly it's possible to make a profit and and the volunteering aspects not to be the reason for that profit so can we see a clear correlation between profit making activity and the use of inverted commas volunteers in order to do that now my argument would be that at least by that test most um, social enterprise organizations would pass yeah. they would pass that okay, test so as an entity as an organization they aren't they aren't if you like guilty of that so you're more you're more than talking about um, whether um, the role that it's undertaking is replacing a role and, and by design is replacing a role that previously uh, would have been done through um, you know th 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 through more direct means on the one hand and there will be a question in some cases it might in most cases it won't and secondly is its actual volunteer policy a good one and that's and that's a, that's a, that's a standard that um, should attach itself to all organisations um, in all sectors. So I think it's a, a little bit about, about it is not looking at it as one great big amorphous sector and trying to say you know um, social enterprise, voluntary sector, third sector. Are we making a statement about that sector as a whole, but breaking it down into like profit? function and um, uh, uh, and and good process and if you're not making a profit if you if your function's good and your process for volunteers good then you're you, you, you're, you're passing this pretty effectively thank you Kim. okay thank you very much <laughs> uh, I've just got uh, one a question the community bubbles 
is there something that you could send us about that? Because it sounds like a good idea. Yes. It sounds like something that could possibly be used in, I yeah. don't know, with volunteers I, and everything. Um, the, 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 we're taking it to Brussels next week because we're about a four country. If you we'll come over. I, I, well, the reason I'm raising that is that because we've done it, we've made it as an installation for that thing. So the panels, and they're big, they're five metre by five metre, but the panels are wonderful sort of images, photographs of the four country volunteering and their stories. So we've actually um, asked the Parliament here if, they, if they'd like for this to be put on in the Parliament itself. So I could combine something like that with maybe a, an invitation to you to, to come and try one out, one of our bubble experiences. <laughs> and but besides that, clearly consent to you more information about it. It's, we're definitely taking off some point. OK, that sounds very useful. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, George and Dave, for, for uh, your evidence today. That was very helpful. The uh, committee will consider the evidence we've just heard when we discuss our work programme in private at the end of this meeting. And I suspend briefly to allow you both to leave the table. Thank you very much. Agenda item 5 is the consideration of negative instruments 35, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45 and 77 as listed on the agenda. These instruments are laid under the negative procedure which means that their provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on motions to annul them. No motions to annul have been laid. I'll go through these in order set out in the agenda. Firstly, SSI 35. Do members have any comments? No. Yo, Andy? Yes, I just want to put on the record that I think it's wrong that um, public revenues of approaching £3 billion are passed by Parliament on a negative instrument. I continue to be concerned about that. OK, thank you. Um, OK, in that case, no other comments. I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? Thank you. That is agreed. SSI 39, do members have any comments? Andy? I continue to be concerned about the small business bonus scheme. Uh, many, some of the richest people in the world are qualifying for this. Um, I welcome the government's intention to review it, but I hope this is the last time this will come forward to this committee. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I understand that the, the threshold is curtailed. So it's if you have several premises, the rate of value cannot exceed 30k. Is it 35k now? So excuse me. Collectively, I don't know. Is that the richest people in the world, convener? Well, Donald Trump? I don't know. Anyway, 35k. We've all got our comments on the record. Uh, and I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. SSI 40, do members have any comments? Okay, I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? agreed. I think that is agreed. SSI 41, do members have any comments? Therefore, I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? agreed. That is agreed. SSI 42, do members have any comments? I invite the committee, therefore, to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? agreed. Once again, that is agreed. SSI 43, do members have any comments? I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? That is agreed. SSI 44, do members have any comments? Andy. Thank you, um, Convener. Um, it's worth noting for the record that the transitional relief that's been granted here is on the annual gross bill. Um, I've got many constituents who qualified and claimed small business bonus scheme uh, who've been paying modest amounts uh, or indeed no rates whatsoever, um, who suddenly, because of a revaluation, their gross value uh, exceeds the small business bonus scheme threshold and therefore they're experiencing a 100, 200, 300, 400 percent increase uh, in their uh, rates uh, bill because the transitional relief only applies to the uh, gross value. Again, I don't think these, this kind of um, fiscal uh, proposal should be being brought forward in negative instruments with so limited um, opportunity for scrutiny. Okay, your, records, your comments are on record. Uh, the, the only other point I'd make is that I, I, I do think quite separately the committee might want to consider um, look or getting information on the outstanding appeals from the revaluation that did take place, because I think there's still significant okay. outstanding numbers of appeals, but no, quite separately. Yes, separately. Okay, right. We'll take that into consideration later. And uh, therefore, I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we all agreed on that point? Mm. That is agreed. SSI 45, do members have any comments? No. Uh, invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? Mm. Thank you. And finally, SSI 77, do members have any comments? I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? agreed. That is agreed. That concludes the public part of today's meeting, and I now move the meeting into private. <laughs>